Russell, come. We wanted to give you as much time as possible. Yeah. Now, Russell and I have known each other for many, many years. He's a, you know, this morning when I was praying, I was saying, Father, we just embrace this general in our city. He's a general in our city. And the last time I spoke with him, we were at a leaders meeting and I just said, only God knows what it's cost this man. The nations, Afghanistan, Pakistan, these are not easy nations to minister to. He's gone to so many nations, I don't even know how many, but this man has laid down his life, 44 nations. He's laid his life down for Jesus. He's like a modern day Paul. Travelling the nations, you know. I don't know if you were stoned or left for dead. <laughs> uh, a couple of times. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, without walls, it's great to be here. I want to come closer. You know, in our city, <clears throat> I've been to a, a number of uh, prayer meetings and conferences and summits and quite frankly, it leaves me cold. What we desperately need now, and I believe God just told me that while I was sitting there, one day soon we're going to see it. We're going to be praying about it. This morning, by the way, it's for you. I'm going to lay hands on every one of you. There's something important this morning, so I want to, I want to preach you, to you prophetically. But then I'm going to pray for you. I, I, I don't want to go too long, but, but I have a lot to say. And all I'm understanding is this. One day soon, and I'm, I feel so urgent about this, because I've been seeing a lot of compromise, a lot of lukewarmness, a lot of stuff that people call great. In actual fact, it's not. And what God is saying, there's coming, and it's coming soon, that's what this city needs, like a breaking and a cracking in such a great manner, in such a way it's like an icebreaker going through and breaking large boulders of ice and moving it out of the way. And God is going to have to move, I believe he's going to move a lot of things out of the way so he can have his way. Because there's one thing he's doing right now, he's taking back his church. He's taking it back. Because man has had it for too long. And I, I want to say to you that Jesus is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. On the day of Pentecost, the scripture says something unbelievable because from all around the world, God brought the world to Jerusalem on that day. And he bought him for a reason. And here it is. It says there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites uh, from uh, dwellers from Mesopotamia, uh, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. And this is what they said. Those people that were in Jerusalem, they heard them speaking in their own language. And they said, they said this, we do hear them speak the wonderful works of God. All I've heard in the last 10 years is the wonderful words of man. And I can tell you this, God's going to bring back the works. He's going to bring it back in a way and he's looking for people that he can use in that way because really and truly, as I said before, this is for you this morning. Now, and if you want me to, I hope you all do. I'm going to lay hands on you. And you are going to carry something because I understand that Acts chapter 3 it startled me as I read it, and I read it so many times, thousands of times. I read it again recently, and it says here that Peter and John, in, the, in chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. Beautiful means good timing. Good timing. God always has good timing. He never has bad timing. You were saved on good timing. You were healed on good timing. You were blessed on good timing. You met your wife. You met your husband on good timing. God is always a good timing God. 
And it says here, who seeing Peter and John enter into the temple, about to go into the temple, put his hand out and ask for money. And Peter fastening his eyes, listen carefully, Peter fastening his eyes on him, said, look on us. Look on us. Look carefully on us. And then he said, silver and gold have I none. And bang, he came out with a great and the unbelievable words. But such as I have, give I unto thee. Then he grabbed him by his hand, yanked him up. And he leaping and praising and jumping and praising God, he was completely and utterly healed. You know something? There's a difference between silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Big difference between the two. If he hadn't grabbed him by the hand and pulled him up, that guy would have still been lame. I wonder how many times you have something, but you don't give something. And this is about that this morning. So I want you to grab it. I want you to get it because it's important. It said, we would hear them speak the wonderful works of God. The word works is in the Greek. It means the working of miracles, the glorious greatness, strange, extraordinary, astonishing wonders. And I look at the church and I say, where are they? I went to a prayer meeting the other day and I heard four people preach. That was disgusting. And people got up and said, oh, how wonderful. I had this strong prophetic word in there. I thought, no, I can't bring that. I had to walk out. You see, strange, extraordinary, astonishing wonders. Some people go, well, I got, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I can speak in other tongues. Whoop-de-doo, so what? And I wonder how many have great gifts, great callings, great purposes, great destinies. And I see it in the church all the time. And it dies on the vine. It never gets realized. I wonder as I look around here, I wonder if there are nation shakers here. I wonder if there are miracle workers here. I wonder... I hear an amen. I wonder if there are miracle workers here. I wonder if there are somebody here that can go and break a nation open. Jesus did. The apostle Paul did. Every one of those guys did. Every one of those women did. And there's coming a time very soon. God's going to have his way. And we better get out of the way. That's all I can say. (laughs) We better get out of the way. You see, (laughs) was tongues a means to an end or was it an end in itself? You see, I love it what they said, you know, uh, the whole essence of how it took place. But when all those people gathered together, you know, those guys were from Turkey and Greece and Iran, Crete, uh, Libya, Italy, Arabia, the whole world. We do hear them once speak the wonderful works of God. My God, I want to see that. I want to see it in the church. I want to see it in the church. I want to see it in the prayer meetings. Don't you? Aren't you guys hungry for something extra? I wonder how many times we stretch, stretch, stretch the truth. And God is looking for people like that this morning that he can actually use. Here. This wonderful thing, 18 nations came. It mentions about 18 nations. In actual fact, there was probably 20 or 30 nations in Jerusalem. Every one of those people went out there and affected their own nation. By what? By what they carried. This morning it's about what you carry, nothing what you say. I don't hear what you say. I want to hear what you carry. I want to see what you carry. That's the difference. If you carry it, then you better use it. And God is looking for those people. He's looking for young men. He's looking for young women. He's looking for the middle aged. He's looking for the old. We have so much to give. 
But don't say you've got much and do little. God is actually saying so much. You see, what do they hear? The phenomenal, strange, astonishing wonders of God. 120 Jews in an upper room. So what were they hearing? They said, oh, well, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, he's in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Were they hearing mysteries? For I, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. My understanding says I don't understand, but my spirit man does. Time for your spirit man to stand up. Time for you to, to generate something and build your spirit man. Time for your spirit man to take over, to be led by the spirit. The word led in the Greek means to be navigated by. God himself wants to navigate your life and navigate it now, not, not tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, it's always now. That's why he wants to grab some people because he knows your potential. He knows your destiny. He knows your purpose. And he knows what you've still got that maybe you don't think you have. You see what happens is this. Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, was a full-on, supernatural, spontaneous, instantaneous, hypernormal microcosm of God's master plan. God's got a master plan for this nation. He's got a master plan for this church. And I believe that's going to be a building. You're going to have your own building. You're going to have it very soon. God's going to show it to you. I'm telling you, because you need it. Not only do you need it, you're doing a mighty work in this city and have done for 30 odd years. I used to miss going to have a coffee with that bloke of yours. You see, it's what they carried. It's what you carry. See, the Spirit of God does an inward work. Then he does an upward work. Then he does an outward work. Silver and gold I don't have. But that's not what you need. I came here, I look at you, and I say, son, that's as I've, I'm carrying what you need. I woke up this morning with you in my heart. I know you're going to be healed. So don't put your hand out to me. I'm not going to give you any money because I don't have any. I don't even have two coats. But what I have, I'm going to give to you. See, to the Jew... In 1 Samuel 5, 1 to 5, would you turn with me, please? And here's this wonderful story of the Philistines doing something stupid. And the Philistines, verse 1, took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, the fish god. Half man, half fish. <laughs> and, and, and they set the ark of God next to an idol. That's even more stupid than you can think of. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow morning... Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose earlier in the next morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on upon his face to the ground before the ark of God, and, the, and his head of Dagon uh, was cut off, and his hands were cut off, and only the palms of his hands. So if your head's gone... You can't speak. If your hands are gone, you can't do anything. And it was like God saying, shut up. I'm going to cut your hands off as well. You see, I'm the Lord. I take over. Jesus won the victory at the cross. He gave that victory unto you. He gave it unto me. 
And all I'm saying is this. When I first went overseas and I landed in India of all places, I didn't know what I was going into. I had no idea. No one ever told me what it was going to be like, what kind of food, what kind of atmosphere, what kind of people. Now I know Indians. Don't worry. <laughs> I can preach like an Indian too and talk like one. And I can tell you, I was frightened. I was scared. I sat on a, a steam train from Bombay to the middle of India. Two days. Glenn, you know this. Glenn and myself went a few years later. We had a great time. It was unbelievable. But I was frightened. And I said to the American team leader, I said, Douglas, how do I do this? He said, Russ will get bold. So I did. And in some places I remember Jeff Woodward saying, now Russ, when you're going to preach this morning, be gentle with my people. <laughs> I hope you invite me again, Jeanette. I said, but I... Anyway... An upward word, an inward work, an outward work. My work has always been on the outside, although I've done a lot here. And what happened here, they took the ark of God. Now, the head's cut off, the palms are cut off, and all I could see was the palms turned upside. Finish. Therefore, says verse 5, Neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come to Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. And the hand of the Lord was heavy upon those in Ashdod and he destroyed them and he sent a plague to them for years. You want to play games with God? You see, the capture of the ark meant Hebrew weakness, dishonor. The very presence of God was in that, the Shekinah glory and presence was inside that box made with human hands, outlaid and overlaid with gold by a guy called Bezalel, who God gave wisdom to. He never knew how to do it, and God gave him wisdom to do it. God gives wisdom. I remember a Hebrew, a, a, a Hindu lady many years ago in, an, in a village asked, got saved for the first time. It, this old Hindu lady said, I don't know how to read the Bible because I, I, can't, I can't read in English. I can hardly read in Hindi. Well, we all prayed for her. She went home that night, opened up a Bible, could read perfectly well from that day on. See, my God and your God is a miracle worker. And he can do anything, anytime, any way. That's what we got to grab hold of and see. And see, the very presence of God was gone. It was a defeat. The glory had vanished. Now Ichabod was living. Ichabod is the, the minus the glory. No glory. Oh boy, I've been in some places. <coughs> see, and I can tell you this, the ark of God needed no human help. It can handle itself <coughs> by what it contained. And you know, I love it. Uh, can I have that bottle of... Thanks, Jeanette. In Exodus 40, verses 34 to 35. Exodus 40. Got your Bibles? 35 to 40. Ah, listen, great. listen carefully. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Would to God, one day we'd walk into this place and we'd all be on the floor. And getting healed and getting saved and getting delivered. 
and getting blessed. Trouble is, we got to grab hold of it. We got to believe it. We got to speak it. We got to declare it. See, the cloud covered the tabernacle. The glory filled the tabernacle. Oh, I speak in other tongues. So what? It's like the <clears throat> English pastor called David Pawson has gone to be with the Lord. He had an, an Anglican bishop come to him and said, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. So David prayed with him and he couldn't quite dare grasp it. And then all of a sudden he went, some, some word like shabba and he ran out the door speaking shabba-dabba, shabba-dabba, shabba-dabba. And yelling, I've got it, I've got it. Shabba-dabba. And David was a week later in Kenya and he was standing in the back of a shop where, and there's a big crowd there, and he heard this Anglican bishop go, shabba dabba. <laughs> and he went, oh my God, he's here. <laughs> he pushed through the crowd, and it was an African. And suddenly you realized, I thought he didn't get it. But he got it. And when you think you don't have it, you got it. When you think you don't carry it, you do. I was with a bunch of guys that were in my first church in the 70s in Midland. 100 years ago, babes. <laughs> and they said to me, Russell, you haven't aged one little bit. I said, keep talking, son. <laughs> and I love these guys, Jeanette. But only one guy never said this. But everybody, else, oh, I've got a, I've got, now I've got a, I've got a pacemaker, and I've got a, a new knee, and I've got a new shoulder, and I felt like saying, "Have you got a new head?" <laughs> you want to speak it? You'll get it. Oh, every time it gets cold. Oh, I get arthritis down my back. It's my heart condition. No, baby, it's nothing to do with yours. You speak like that, you declare it, you bring it in. See, God, in 1 Corinthians 1, 28, I love this. God has chosen the base things of this world. And the things which are despised has God chosen. And yes, the things that are not. Who are you? I'm the not. <laughs> not what? Not educated enough. Not wise enough. Not prayed up enough. <clears throat> not thinking I can do it enough. Not ready. Don't want to. And I say to young people, do you want me to train you? you want me to teach you? I have a bunch of businessmen that come to my, to at least two or three times a week. I speak a couple of, couple of times a month for two hours to a bunch of business guys in, in Singapore on Zoom. You see, it's like this. You read something or think something and you go, yeah, okay, well, the scripture says, you know, uh, the worlds were framed by the word of God and God chooses the despised things, the base things. The useless things. The things that are nothing. But how can a thing be not? Well, if you bring it down to an atomic level, all things are made of atoms in the universe. Which are made of subatomic atomic particles. But they only exist in a state of possibilities until you read the Bible and go, oh, my God, I believe it. I believe it. When you pray believing, you shall receive. You need to remind God what he says in his word. 
All things are possible to him who believes. I can do all things who gives God who gives me strength. I'm not weak. When the weak say they are not weak, they are strong. Then they're strong. Let the poor say they are rich. Let the hungry say bread's coming. Who was that great man who lived in England? Never asked for anything. And he got something. What's his name? Yeah. Miracles at the door. I remember the, 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 the African pastor, uh, the American pastor, <clears throat> went to Africa somewhere and he was a translator, worked for a translation company. And he went into some part of Africa and uh, there was this great guy. He was translating, uh, a black African, translating the word of God, that word in their language. Anyway, a couple of days later, the, Af uh, the American pastor said, now I'm going to go, but I want you to tell me. Now, we are going to send you 500 US dollars a month to help you. You've only got a meager house and you don't have enough uh, equipment and you don't have enough food. You, don't <clears throat> you can only have a bicycle to run around in. We want to buy you a small car. And the African pastor said, uh, whatever his name was, he said, no, 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 I don't want anything from you. He said, why not? He said, it's like this. Me and my wife, we get together when we have a need. If it's for food or for money or for clothing or whatever. And we may write a list and we pray. We say, Jesus. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're my provider. Then we have a little green basket. We take it and we put it out the front door, close that front door with all that list in there. Hands up those who do that. And he said every morning when I do that, I open the door and that basket's full of all that I need. See, it's not what you say. You can say it until the cows come. Oh, I meet these cows. Oh, I've done this and I've done that and I've written this book and, and some of them get up to preach and for 40 minutes they'll take an offering. No, no, no. You're not going to give me any money. God has given me everything I need. Where to come from? The cross. My health comes from the blood. When I took that bread this morning, I said, this heals my body. You see, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. How many? All. How many afflictions? Many. Who from? You know who. See, God wants to do something. The concordant literal translation says, so what things being observed has not come out of what is appearing. Your faith will bring something out of nothing, always. Your faith observes those things that are not and gives it substance and gives it appearance. And Paul was caught up into paradise and what did he say? I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So I can't tell you what I saw, but I know what I saw. The first time I ever saw Jesus with my eyes open, I explained to a bunch of Baptists that were with me. We were sitting in a Pentecostal church at night, and Jesus walked by me with my eyes open. I saw him. And when I explained on the way home to these Baptists, they said, that's stupid. They brought the sick and laid them in the street that just the shadow of Peter passing by would heal them. I remember the first time I saw Derek Prince in Singapore. <clears throat> he carried a phenomenal anointing. 
There were a thousand people in this 10 o'clock meeting in Singapore. I was sitting in the front with a bunch of pastors and all of a sudden he walked in the back door. Manifestations of devils happened everywhere. He didn't say a word. But it's what he carried. It's what you carry. It's what you carry. Speak to me until the cows come home and won't make that much difference. Paul said, I'd rather boast in my infirmities rather than complain of them. The Dalai Lama said, Jesus of Nazareth, like Buddha, had reached a high state of enlightenment. <laughs> In one nation next door, there are 360 million gods. Cows and snakes and rats and... I was sitting in a, in, a, in a train going across a big bridge and I was having a cup of tea in the, in the, in the cubicle. <laughs> Stop laughing. Um, you know, yeah, that car where you get your food and drink. <clears throat> Indian sitting next to me. I said, hello, my name is Russell. Hello, Russell, my name is Mr. Ratnam. I said, hello, Mr. Ratnam. Hindu. Ah. So when we were going over the bridge, long way down, I said, hey, Mr. Ratnam, what would happen if this train Went all with the side. Boom. And he went. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back as a cow or a snake or a. In five minutes. He came to Jesus. See. There's another religion that says, oh, Jesus is not divine. How can God have a son? You see, we have a lot of oh, presence of God was in the meeting. Please don't get me wrong. I'm hungry and thirsty for what I'm not seeing. Oh, presence was there. I said, any manifestation? That's what's missing. You've got more than you realize. Would the London Philharmonic Orchestra come back, please? <laughs> hey, hello. Where? Keep going, keep going. Hey, hello. Where's the orchestra? <laughs> oh, gone, eh? Hey, all right. A yes. <laughs> lot of money. They get charged a lot of money. Are you ready to carry? I ask again, are you ready to carry? Young, middle-aged and old, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how unbelieving you are. I don't care what's happened to you. What if I make a mistake? You know, people say, oh, do you get words of knowledge? I said, yeah. Were they all right? No. Nah. What if you make a mistake? God doesn't care. Only people do. Oh, he made a mistake. I had a well-known Australian prophet pick me out in the back of a Pentecostal service and say, you sir, you're a businessman, but God has not forgotten you. Don't worry, and uh, you'll get more business in the next week. (laughs) 
And the senior pastor rang me an hour later when I got home and he went, oh, Russell, I'm terribly sorry. That bloke didn't know what he was talking about. He's a well-known Aussie prophet. And about 12 o'clock in the night, the prophet rang me. I said, oh, don't worry, brother. We all can't get it right. I've had egg on my face many times. But what are you shaking your head for? You know, Jesus, yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Do you know, years, no, this, no, this is true. Years ago, first time I actually heard uh, Russell speak, I wasn't married to Phil or anything. I came to New Day and I was sitting there and I think I had sung a song. They'd asked me to sing a little item. I sang a little item and this loud guy came up and preached. Loud shouting. Anyway, I'm in the prayer line and he begins to pray for me. And he begins to prophesy over me. He goes, you're going you're gonna to sing to hundreds of thousands of people. I'm going, just because I've had the guitar and I sang to a few people. And you said that. You said you're going to sing in front of hundreds of thousands of people. I, in my heart, mocked it. That's the other end. I thought, I mocked it. I'm not going to sing to hundreds of that. I know I can sing if the Lord puts you in one. But no way. But you have really went on about it. You know what? Within the year, I was in China singing on a television station, singing to hundreds of thousands of people. So it goes, do you know what? God's not limited even where I rejected the word. But God did it. That's a true story. I've still got a great big fan. Some have seen it. I've got a great big Chinese fan that was presented on this television show. Amazing. I'm not going to forgive you for that. When, you see, the whole essence of praying in a tongue is to change the spiritual atmosphere. When you change the spiritual atmosphere, you change the natural atmosphere. You speak it in the air, declare it to God, watch Him move on the earth. Oh, I pray in tongues. Babble, babble, babble. For five minutes. I tell you, in my age, God's done something new in me, bro. I tell you what, I'm on the hot trail again. I said, Lord, open those stupid borders and let me go. Okay, finish. Finish. Are you ready? Can someone take this over there, please, Roger? Okay, settle down. Jesus is here. Where are you going, Wanda? Good, very much. You're not going anywhere. Are you ready to carry? Get up and come out of here. Straight lines, straight lines, straight lines. Roger, can you bring that water to me? I'll put it there. Straight lines, straight lines, straight lines. No talking. in the spirit. 